Thank you, Lord. I remember um, that, I think this is probably in, let me think for a sec. Um, when did we go there? Okay. In, in the beginning of February, we had, I talked about this before, but we had some debt that we accrued not really because of anything that we had done. It was just situations that were happening. Um, Jason's dad's funeral, just a couple of different things. And so, uh, and then some medical bills from when Haley, you remember when she bumped her head? Well, we didn't have insurance at the time, so we got to pay all of that. And so I was just thinking about these things, and we hadn't really made any headway in paying those things off. So I had been kind of feeling the stress of it, but then I was like, this isn't the right way to handle this. So I remember on Restaurant Row over here in Prestonsburg, I, th I don't know if I was by myself. I think I was by myself. I must have been by myself, or I wouldn't have been able to do this without being interrupted. But I remember just thanking God. I thank you, Lord. You're, you have already taken care of this. I thank you for the provision. You have made a way. I just began to thank, thank, thank the Lord. I had been doing it sporadically, but I, I was like, no, I'm, I'm done worrying about this and even thinking about it. I'm just going into thank you mode. Thank you, Lord. You've taken care of it. I got my eyes on you. I'm praising you. And I did that maybe five, ten minutes, and all of a sudden, it was like this joy sprung up in me, and the weight of it completely dissipated. I was like, all right, amen, thank you, Lord. It was only about a week or two later where we went to Life in Christ Church, and as you know, they doubled the offering, which was a big offering from a big church. Then we went to South Dakota. Anyway, in a matter of about two or three weeks, all of, it, all of the debt was wiped out. Hallelujah. That's what I'm saying. I was super happy about it. When we mix faith, faith is the active ingredient. I, I've, I've talked to my kids about this. Just like parents, how many of y'all, slime or, or grandparents, the slime, it's like this powder, but you have, yeah, that's how I feel about Neil. It's, I curse it in Jesus' name. It's not allowed in our house. It still finds its way in there sometimes. But I hate it, and I'm like, when I see it, I'm like, get it out, get it out. But usually those little kits come with this powder, but then it has something called the activator. And you have to put the activator in, and that's what makes it slimy and, and so enjoyable for kids and such a torment to um, the adults. Faith is always the activator. It is always the active ingredient. Just like if you look at a, at a list of um, on, a, on medications, there are inactive ingredients, there are active ingredients. Faith is the active ingredient. And we're going to talk today about one aspect of faith. So I'm calling today's message the closer. Everybody say the closer. What's a closer? Well, if you think about in sports, maybe a baseball game, and it's... You know, maybe one team has a narrow lead. Maybe they're up by one run, but they're in the field. Well, they don't want the team they're against to get any hits. So they might bring in the closer pitcher who has a really great record of striking people out. And they're going to bring in their closer, the guy who's going to close the deal, who's going to finish this other team off. A closer could be a really great song at the end of a concert that everybody knows that everybody's going to get in on. But the, the definition of a closer is the last part of a performance or series. The closer is the last part of a performance or series. Or it may be a person skilled at bringing a business transaction to a satisfactory ending. So as it relates to our faith life, there is a closer. I'm going to tell you what it is because I believe that the Lord is helping me understand this better personally, but I also believe as a church, this is an ingredient that's been missing a little bit. Maybe we haven't emphasized it enough, but it's time to emphasize it. In our faith walk, the closer is this thing called praise. Everyone say praise. Praise. Praise is the closer. Sometimes our faith life has a glitch, and we get in a bit of a rut, and I'm I'm reading the Bible still every day, or if I miss a day, I'm reading it as much as I possibly can. I'm, I'm faithful in reading the Word. I'm listening to the Word. I'm listening to people preach. I'm, I'm there every service that I can be. So I'm hearing. That's not a problem. And I'm, I'm doing good. Maybe some of us are doing good at confessing the Word. I'm doing good at confessing. I'm speaking, speaking. 
But a lot of us then think that's it. I hear, I believe, faith comes by hearing. So I hear, I'm diligent to hear, and faith comes easily when we hear. So I believe, I believe, I believe. Now the second step is I speak. I line my word, my mouth up with what I believe in my heart. For some of us, that's harder than others, especially if you were raised in a negative household or you're around negative people who just are always speaking the worst case scenario. They're just always, it's so natural to their flesh to say something bad. Well, just maybe if, if that was you, it's unnatural, maybe seemingly to your flesh, but your spirit is very natural to your spirit to speak life and to speak truth, to speak faith. So I think a lot of times we do those first two steps really, really good. Are you reading the word? Yes. Are you speaking the word? Yes. Well, that's not the end of the faith walk. There's a closer involved. And if you do steps one and two and you keep doing steps one and two and just you get into a rut spinning your wheels and you start to get frustrated. Why? I'm doing the thing. I'm speaking the word. I'm hearing the word. I'm speaking the word. I'm hearing the word. I keep telling the mountain to move, telling the mountain to move, telling the mountain to move, but it's not moving. There is an element of persistence and perseverance always. I heard someone say, I think it was Keith Moore, we only have as much faith as we have endurance. Our faith level or our faith, yeah, our, our faith level is going to run out when our endurance runs out. If we don't have any stamina, if we don't have any stick stick to itiveness, if we're not able to stand in the face of adversity, then we could have all the faith at the beginning, just like there's those different kinds of soil. This one kind of soil, the seed falls on it, Jesus said, and quickly it springs up, but because it doesn't have any depth, it's, it's not deep, there's no, the roots can't go deep, well, it quickly fades away. It's, it's, okay, yes, I believe. And by day four, they're like, oh, it's not working. Well, no, you just lack endurance. But if you have been hearing and speaking and you've been enduring and still... It's nothing's changing. I'm talking about after some time, it's right to run some diagnostics. Okay, I'm doing this. I'm doing this. The Bible says when I do this and this, there is a, a, a known outcome, an expected outcome, a guaranteed outcome. This is the thing about faith. It's a guaranteed outcome when we do it right. God does not hide things from us. He makes it so plain, but a lot of times we get in this rut, 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 and we don't even run any diagnostics. We're like, I'm doing everything right. Well, if we're not getting results, we're probably not doing something right. Yeah. How dare us question ourselves? Human nature, flesh, is to, to automatically blame God. That's why so many bad um, doctrines. Because it could never be my fault. But I think the, why the faith message is so disliked is because it's, it's personal responsibility. <laughs> Jesus said, according to your faith, be it unto you. Uh, uh, the faith life really in the faith message, disables every excuse. Man. The real faith message takes all the blame off of God, takes all the blame off of people, what they did do or didn't do or what kind of family you were or weren't raised in. The real faith message dismantles and dismisses every excuse and lays all of the blame, I could say, or, or all of the results right at our doorstep. It is, it's, you could see it, depending on if you're pessimistic or optimistic, you could see it as, man, that stinks. Or you could say, wow, that's really empowering. That no matter where I came from, no matter what I currently have in my possession, no matter what my, my position is right at the moment, no matter what people have or haven't done or the good or the bad or the no matter any of that no matter what my past is right now according to my faith my whole life can change for the better every aspect of my life it's in my power it's in my power that would be the right way to see it 
Everything in your life, everything in my life, everything that is a problem or obstacle or contradiction is subject to change if you will change it, if I will change it. We don't like that. A lot of times our flesh, I should say our flesh doesn't like that because we, we automatically just hear work and flesh doesn't like work. But it's not flesh-empowered work. It's spirit-empowered work. Grace is the empowerment to do what God calls us to do. And, and it produces supernatural results that we cannot get or attain outside of grace. So faith is ultimate personal responsibility. The faith message is everything in my life can change for the better when I do this whole thing according to the word of God, according to his prescribed plan. But if I'm doing what I know to do and I'm spinning the wheels, it's time to diagnose the problem. Some people will just never course correct. Some people never take inventory. They're just, they're just rather, I'm, I'm doing it right. I'm doing it right. I'm doing it right. No, nah, not if, not if there's any, not any joy, not if there's no peace, not if you're frustrated. Okay. Talking to myself here too. As soon as frustration enters the picture, we doing something wrong because faith is rest. Hebrews four says, he that believes has entered into rest. Frustration is about as opposite as it comes to rest. Yes. I'm going to talk to the ladies for a minute. Does anything agitate you more when there are things to be done than to see your husband sitting in a chair? There is nothing, almost, in this world that bugs me more. Ladies, I'm just going to look at you. I also, this is for the men, this will help the men know that it's not just you that feels this way. It's all women everywhere, universal. There are things that need to happen. We have a time limit. Things need to happen. And I see you sitting there relaxing. How dare you? Get up. I'm stressed out just looking at you. Frustration. They are at rest. <laughs> they apparently have a belief that somehow the things are going to get done. Hello, I'm the one doing the things. But anyway, Jason's not here, so I'm picking on. They know things are going to, they know. It's going to happen. It's going to, it'll get done. They are at rest. The person that is opposite of them is in frustration mode. It has to get done. Why is it happening? Why are you sitting there? Don't you know what time it is? Don't you know we have, and this really this, and if I don't get this done, I have a window. And if I don't do this, and they're just like, chill out. Women, men are a good picture of rest. I'm not making fun right now. I'm being for real. We could learn a thing or two. I'm being serious as much as I kind of hesitate to say that. When frustration enters the picture, we're not at rest. <sighs> Taking so long, I'm so frustrated. Why, why, why? We're missing something. Time to run. Diagnostics time. Let's take inventory because faith has two companions, peace and joy. And when peace is lacking... And when joy is lacking, faith is not operating. We're spinning, 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 acting, speaking. Can we speaking the word? Speaking the word. Speaking. I'm speaking the word. Mountain, 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 move. Mountain, move. Mountain, move. Mountain, move. Mom's like, do the rest of the equation. So number one, are you hearing the word? That's how faith comes. Number two, are you speaking the word? That's how faith is released. Again, I have to say this. Faith in your heart is not enough. It will not move anything. Faith in your heart will do nothing for you or the people around you or the situation. It's just step one. Sue, so if you're going to make some cookies and you, pour the you put the flour into the, into the bowl, uh, is that sufficient? You're going to get the cookies. I'm pouring flour. Why isn't the... Get some more flour. Pour... I don't have cookies. Get some more. Pour it in. Just keep pouring the flour. How dumb is that? Well, it's foolish. She's got one part of the recipe. She just keep doing that part. Just keep doing that part. No, it's not going to produce anything. 
Faith has to be released. Faith stored up in the heart. That's just a starting point. If we don't follow on to the next part, then we'll just be consumers of the word and not like Neil just said, not doers. We're just consuming, 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 consuming. And that does not result in anything good. Actually, that causes us to be deceived. That actually dilutes us and waters us down and makes it to where we have no evidence, no fruit, no proof of our faith. We just are hearers only deceiving ourselves. And those people, unfortunately... They end up building this house, but it's on sand. And it looks good. It looks great because they, they, they could quote the word if they need to. But because they never release anything out of their mouth, a storm takes them out. A storm causes great damage in their life. Why? Because faith in the heart is not enough. It has to be released. It has to be expressed. Just like, you know, thank God times have changed a lot. But some of you grew up in households that that love was never expressed verbally. You, were, you never heard your parents say, I love you, or, or it was so rare, maybe after you're already grown. It, it wasn't common to express it through touch or, or, or just come here hugging each. It, it was very, it used to be not very common. In the same way, faith just stored up in our heart, not expressed, it's inactive, it's inoperative. It's not going anywhere, it's not changing anything. So first step is to hear and to believe, to believe, to believe. Number two is to release what God in here has to come out, out of our mouth. It has to have expression out. But if you're doing those two things and still not seeing anything, it's time to introduce step three. And it is praise praise, praise and thanks and give thanksgiving to the Lord. Praise is the closer in this deal. I'm going to prove it to you. Steps one and two are pretty quick. You can hear the word. You can read the word. You know, 15 minutes. You can read. Did that. Now I can speak to this mountain very quickly. I can speak to the pain. I can speak to the lack. That's pretty quick. That's going to take 30 seconds or less. Take, I'm telling you, pick yourself up and go, pain, in Jesus' name, I rebuke you. I command you to leave my body and healing to spring up and to overtake any symptom in Jesus' name. Remember, we, we've talked about this, our whole attitude about this, we're not looking for healing to come from outside. Like, got to get it, got to get it. No, it's in there. It's in your spirit. Salvation, everything that we need, Ephesians 1 says this in the message translation. Everything that we need, God thought about it in advance. Just like as parents, if we're going to go somewhere, we, especially moms, we're thinking like, okay, men do it in a different way. Moms are thinking about kids like, she likes this snack, but he doesn't, so I need this snack and the snack and the snack in case she spits this one out. We're going to have to, okay, need the bottles, need the toys, need the books, need the iPads, and have them charged. We're, we're thinking like all the things that we could possibly need. If any need, I need an extra passy, need an extra bottle in case we leave it somewhere. We think about all the things. And men, men are thinking about the car. I need to get the oil chain. I need to check the tires. I need to blah, blah, blah ahead of time, and the moms pack it all in the suitcase. Well, Ephesians 1 in the message says, God thought about everything we would ever, ever, ever need, and he put it, he packed it up, he stored it up, and it's called salvation. It's all in there. It's in our spirit. Now, how do we get what's in there out here? Okay, if I paint in my body, whatever is in there, I need it to come out and to manifest in my body. Well, I'm going to do it by believing in the power of God, Power is present right now. Everything I have, I have everything I need. I have it now. I have the deed to it. I have the title deed. It's in there. I believe it's in there. I believe he purchased it for me, and it's in my spirit. He has blessed us, Ephesians 1, with every spiritual blessing. It's, he's already bought it, and he's not holding it in heaven. He has given it to us. But I got to get it from in here to out here to benefit me. So how do I do that? I believe, I speak, but then step three, step three is where we're going to spend the majority of our time. I think a lot of times, here's where we miss it, we get stuck on step two, and we just confess and confess and confess and confess, which is good and proper, and it's time, but it, it has a limited shelf life. You make the confession, and then the, the thing is, now I'm not going to veer away, I'm not going to contradict it now. 
I have spoken to the mountain. I'm not going to keep speaking to it because if I do, then that means I believe it's still there. If I keep just addressing the mountain and looking at the mountain and commanding the mountain, my eyes, my focus is on the mountain. And I'm just staring. It's still there, still there. So I'm confessing, confessing, confessing. Step three takes you away from this plane. Step three lifts your gaze up above the mountain, above the giant, above the contradiction, above the pain, above the lack, above the kids acting crazy or the marriage looking crazy. Step three says, I'm not looking at the mountain. I talk to the mountain and the mountain is moving. So I'm not going to keep staring at something that's moving. I'm going to lift up my gaze and now I'm going to lift up my voice and I'm going to bring this whole deal to a close by praising the Lord. And this is what is to occupy the rest of our time until we see the manifestation of the promise. Unfortunately, we get stuck here because our minds don't want to believe what you're just going to praise God like that's enough. Like that's an, you just say, thank you, Lord, praise. Thank you that it's happening. But that's not enough. That's offensive to our mind, but it's the truth of how we close the deal because we have already believed. We've already spoken. It doesn't say to keep speaking. It says speak to the mountain. Not have a whole conversation ongoing for years. Say your peace to the mountain. And if you believe in your heart and don't doubt, and then you don't contradict it anymore, mountain's moving. Now, how do you make sure that you you outlast whatever process that takes for the mountain to move without getting in doubt and fear and unbelief? Gaze up, eyes up, and voice lifted. Go to Romans 6. I remember I I preached on the power of praise one time here, and I said, praise creates lift. I don't understand the law of lift, and I I, I don't don't pretend to. I don't understand it at all. I got nothing. If Barry was here, he could explain it. I read it yesterday, and I was like, no, I'm not not going to read that again, because I have no earthly clue what that means. But I know that planes go up. (laughs) And in the same way, when we set our gaze on him and begin to out loud, again, praise in your heart is not going to get the job done. No more than you thinking, thank you, thank you, thank you to your husband or I love, I love my wife, but never saying it is not going to get the job done. It has to be expressed. Thanksgiving and praise has to be expressed verbally, out loud with your mouth. And when we praise, there is a, a, a law of lift that is enacted. It, it pulls us out of the seen realm. It pulls us out of our feelings. It pulls us out of the funk that we're in. It pulls us out of the temptation to feel pitiful and, and sorry for ourselves. Ooh. Romans 6. i got to get back on track here. Let's look in the Amplified Classic. I think I forgot to write that down, Sarah. I'm sorry. Romans 6, 16. Do you not know that if you continually surrender yourselves to anyone to do his will? Oh, I'm sorry, Romans 4, 16. I don't know what I was thinking. I wrote it down wrong. Therefore, this is speaking of Abraham, inheriting the promise is the outcome of faith. And depends entirely on faith in order that it might be given as an act of grace to make it stable and valid and guaranteed to all the descendants. Keep going. Uh, Keep going. 17. As it is written, I've made you the father of many nations. He was appointed our father in the sight of God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and speaks of the non-existent things that he has foretold and promised as if they already existed. Keep going. For Abraham, human reasoning for hope being gone, hoped in faith that he should become the father of many nations as he had been promised. So shall your descendants be. He did not weaken in faith. Look at this. He did not weaken in faith when he considered the utter impotence of his own body, which was as good as dead because he was about a hundred years old. 
or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's deadened womb. No unbelief or distrust made him waver, made him doubtingly question concerning the promise of God. Look, but he grew strong and was empowered by faith as he gave praise and glory to God. How in the cat hair? Keep that verse right there. The last one, verse 21. Just keep it up for a few minutes. No, I said the wrong one. The one that, that I just read, I'm sorry. He grew strong. There. How did he, for 25 years, I want us to think about this. Every day, he was getting further away from the promise. Literally. His body was getting older by the day. We can't believe God sometimes for something so simple the contradiction even isn't even growing. His contradiction was getting worse by the day. The impossibility was becoming more impossible by the day. Not only for him, but for his wife who's supposed to be able to conceive and carry a child. So that this is not just him. This involves him and his wife. And both of them are getting further from the promise daily. So how in the world did Abraham stay in a place of faith and not yield to unbelief or distrust? He didn't even waver. He didn't even falter. He didn't compromise at all. How in the world did he do that for 25 years? Hello, 25 years. Picture yourself 25 years ago. Go ahead and calculate that in your head. And imagine believing for one thing for 25 years and being as full of expectation and joy and faith at the end as you were in the beginning. How in the world did he do that? It tells us right here. It wasn't only confessing my name is Abraham, father of many nations. That was part of it. He believed God. He confessed the word. Yes, he would speak his name out. God gave him a new name, which meant Abraham. So he was regularly saying, I am the father of many nations. I am the father. So he is confessing. But that's not all he did, or he would have never inherited the promise. You say, that's impossible. No, Amy just read it. There was a whole generation given a promise. God promised a whole generation that you're going to enter into a promised land. But they did not. Well, God, you failed them. You lied. No. They did not mix what they heard with faith. They did not lift their eyes and praise. They kept their eyes on the situation and they complained. They wept. They questioned. They fussed. They felt sorry for themselves and it cost them the promise. They did not go in. They did not attain what had been prophesied. What God spoke with his own mouth to them, even though he had done signs and wonders, they didn't get it because they didn't close the deal. Abraham does. Because, look at this, he grew strong and was empowered by faith as to the degree that he gave praise and glory to God. After we believe, then we speak to the mountain, we speak to the situation, but we don't stay there. We don't just keep looking at the mountain and talking to the mountain because we believe the mountains look moving. So I'm not going to keep looking at something that's getting out of the way. When I, when I speak, if I believe what I say, then I'm going to have what I say. So I'm going to be happy. And how am I going to express this happiness and this joy and this confidence? I'm going to praise the Lord. And I'm going to praise him until. I'm not going to praise him for 10 minutes one day. I'm not going to praise him at church Sunday. If your whole praise and worship lifestyle happens here for 45 minutes on a Sunday morning, you're missing it. I don't say that ugly. I'm saying there's an invitation to make this part of your daily life. Not only in your prayer closet, but in the car. It's you in the car. Thank you, Lord. I'm telling you, that's more profitable for you than talking to a mountain. If you've already heard the word, you've, you've got your word in for the day, it would be more profitable rather than listening to another sermon. It would be more profitable for you to act, to open your mouth and thank the Lord. 
it would be better for you. I, I heard this lady that I'm loving lately. I just, just found her. Her name is Nancy Dufresne. Dufresne. It's spelled Dufresne, but it's Dufresne. But she talked about, now this is a faith woman. Raised in the word of faith. Kenneth Hagin was her and her husband's spiritual father. So I'm saying the lady knows some stuff. But she gives the example in her personal life that she had been in a season of, of testing. She doesn't say what it was, but it sounded like some kind of mental torment. Just unrelenting. She said it lasted for about a year and a half. So she said she had been praying in the Holy Ghost, which we are big advocates of. That should be part of your daily lifestyle also. But I said this other night at prayer. Just like you can't skimp out on an ingredient in a cake and expect it to come out right, you can't leave the eggs out, can't leave the oil out. You, you, you got to put it all in to get, the, to get the intended outcome. We can't be heavy on one thing and completely forget the other. So reading the Word is, is vital. you got to. But if that's all you're doing, you're not going to inherit the promise. Speaking the word is vital, but if that's all you're doing, you're not going to inherit the promise. Enduring is vital, but if you're not praising the Lord, you're leaving out a major active ingredient that keeps you strong in the meantime, from the time you speak to the mountain, from the time you speak to that giant, to inheriting the promise, there is this thing that will empower and strengthen you and keep you in the right atmosphere, and it's called praise. It's the closer. It's a really big deal. So she talked about, she was praying in the Holy Ghost. She said, hours a day, hours a day. And she knows the word. She's reading the word every day and confessing the word. And she said, this thing was not budging. So after a year and a half, she said, Lord, help me out here. She, she, God, you're unjust. She, she said, Lord, help me. Time to run diagnostics because I've endured Check, check, check. I, okay, I'm doing all the things. What am I missing? And she said, just that quick in her heart, just a, a quiet voice, the praise cure. She said, well, I know what that is. And yeah, I haven't been doing a whole lot of that. So she said for the next several days, she said, now I'm full of the word, so I can do this. She said, I didn't even read my Bible those days. She said, no, because I'm going to do the Bible. There's a time to read, and then there's a time to do. And I know what it says. I have a foundation, but I haven't been doing a really important step in this process. So she said for the next several days, she said for the first three days, her entire devotion life was just praising and thanking God. If you have to, you, you start where you're at. If you're like, I just can't do that. Okay, then, then use music. It's okay. Put some music on that you can enter in and worship with. That's a good starting point. There's no condemnation, but then let that take you further and deeper than your own song, your own words to the Lord. You can praise him in the spirit. You can praise him in tongues. But she said for three days at the beginning, it was really hard. She said every, the, the enemy, it seemed like the, the attack amped up. And just the thoughts of, you think this is going to work? You're just, just saying, thank you, God. You think this is doing anything? No, you need to get back to your healing confessions. You need to read those again. And she said, no, no, I've done that. I know those. This is what I need to do. She said by day seven, she's not reading anymore. She's, she said her entire time she devoted to praising and glorifying God. And she said by day seven, she had people in her house, some kind of get together. And she was so in the habit of just, just constantly under her breath, thank you, Lord, thank you, Lord. You know, we can develop that habit. It's not a bad one. That instead of just filling our mind or being distracted. We can, like, make our mind think about the Lord. We can get in the habit of, thank you, Lord, you're good. Thank you for, when I see something, I, thank you, Lord. Thank you for providing that. Thank you for this person I'm out. Thank you for this job. Thank you for meeting my needs. Just a habit of thanksgiving. She said on day seven, people were at her house. She went in the, uh, to use the restroom. I think she says, oh, thank you, Lord. And just like that, the Lord said, speak to that maneuvering spirit and tell it to stop. She's like, Okay, in Jesus' name, I command the spirit to stop, take your hands off me, and go. She said, I didn't lift my voice. I was in the bathroom, everybody in my house, I'm right there. She said, after that moment in the bathroom, that whole thing was broken off, never dealt with it again. A year and a half, 
But she, she asked the Lord, what am I missing? What am I doing wrong? Seven days devoted to praising the Lord and developing that habit, and the victory came. She said, prayer lays hold of the word, but praise wins the battle. Praise wins the battle. Cra praise creates an atmosphere. Everyone say that praise creates an atmosphere. Oh, yes, it does. Just like complaining creates an atmosphere. Talking to the parents for a minute. You can be in a good mood. What happens to that good mood when the kids just start complaining and fussing and whining? Oh, I feel my good mood dying slowly. It's irritating. It's like, what do you have to fuss about? What? You have everything. You have everything you need. You don't have to think about, oh, we just did this for you. You're really going to fuss about not having this, but look what else you have. Once in a while, not often, a kid in the family, I don't see, I don't see the one, the offender. <laughs> we went to this place. It costs a lot of money. Just so you know, it costs a lot of money to travel as a family of, how many do we have? Seven. Lots of money playing tickets. It's, it's a lot. And we, we took them to the Grand Canyon. We didn't have to, but we did. We did the whole thing. And there happened to be a stupid gift shop at the Grand Canyon. So I'm like, I try, I've learned. I'm like, okay, do the pep talk before. Don't wait for the crisis. Like, tell them ahead of time. We're not buying anything at that gift shop. Okay, we'll buy a magnet at the gift shop. That's all we're buying, okay? We're buying a magnet. Y'all gonna agree on a magnet and we're buying a magnet. Or maybe a sticker for your computer. But that's it. I'm not spending $500 at a gift shop. We have five kids. No. Because we spent thousands to bring y'all here. So we're not gonna buy you a $30 pencil, okay? Well, Sometimes that lesson doesn't go very far. And the day, this seems so fun, and this is amazing. Look at this. It's breathtaking. The mood began to change when the fussing began. That we can't get anything. You never let us get anything. I'm like, we could have left you home with Gigi and saved about $800 just for your plane ticket alone. But we brought you here. Praise creates an atmosphere, but so does complaining. So does self-pity. Man, that's about the worst. You start feeling bad for yourself, you'll run the presence of God right off. He ain't in that at all. It repels the presence of God. Complaining repels God's presence. Feeling sorry for myself, repel. He's not in it at all. My husband, he don't even know. He don't even know. Presence of God is no, he's like, Spirit of God's like, see ya, I ain't helping you. I'm not, I'm, I'm not coming to your party. I'm not involved in this party. Because I want to talk to you about you and your attitude right now. But you just want to fuss. Praise creates an atmosphere. The presence of God, look at Psalm 22. Is that the next one I gave you, Sarah? But you are holy, talking to God, you are enthroned in the praises of Israel. Or God inhabits the praise of his people. God inhabits, God lives in, God is enthroned. His power, his might, his dominion comes down to sit down on praise. This is what this says. Who he is, his might, his glory, his splendor, his ability, his wisdom, everything that he is, when he hears praise, when praise is offered, when praise goes up, his presence comes to sit on that. You talk about an atmosphere? Yes, it creates an atmosphere. The, he the, the atmosphere of heaven is joy, it's jubilation, it's, it's worship, it's praise, it's peace. Why? Because he's there and they're looking at him. In the same way, when we lift our gaze, we lift our eyes to him, we make our mouth 
declare who he is, we begin to exalt and forget about everything troubling us and worship him and give him something real out of our hearts. And atmosphere is created. Why? Because he comes. His presence comes. He manifests in that atmosphere. And when he comes to manifest, guess what doesn't manifest? Fear. Can't. Reason number one, if you struggle with the spirit of fear, you need to praise the Lord more because fear is not going to hang in the presence of God. Doubt, unbelief, not going to hang in the presence of God. The harassing things coming against your mind. Well, what, why is it taking so long? Why, why, why? How come? Wonder why? Is it working? All of those questions are silenced when you're praising the Lord. You and I can't think of more than two, one thing at, at a time. So when your mind is fixed on him, I wonder if that's why the verse says, the Lord will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed upon the Lord. When we make our mind and we make our mouth speak out who he is, guess what? It, it, it distributes and dispels and pushes fear and doubt and worry and anxiety, all of the things that would weaken our faith. When we praise, an atmosphere is created that strengthens our faith, just like Abraham was strengthened as he gave glory to God. Yeah, when God's presence is there, you feel strong. You feel invincible. You feel that mountain is nothing. Look who's with me. Look who's for me. Look who is on my side. He's here. I'm sensing his presence. There is nothing too hard for the Lord. That's the atmosphere that's created when we praise God. And it's possible for us to live in that atmosphere. It's very advantageous for us to live in that atmosphere and not to leave it to complain, not to leave it to question, not to leave it to wonder. But what, why? If God inhabits our praise, I think Bill Johnson says one time, if God inhabits our praise, who inhabits our complaints? Oh, yeah, you start complaining, there's an atmosphere. Man, it just seems worse. The more I talk about it, the worse it seems. The more I give attention to it, the worse I feel. I'm just mad at everybody. I'm mad at everything. I just want to be by myself. I just give me a minute. Now I think, don't I need to lose weight. How come I don't? Give me something to eat. I'm mad. <laughs> Didn't crack in the wall. It hasn't even fixed it. We've lived here three years. Haven't fixed the crack. The car's making a sound. And just continue to. Yeah, yeah. That, that you're being empowered by a spirit now. You're yielding to a wrong spirit. There's a presence. There's an atmosphere around you now. And guess what? It's not strengthening you. It's weakening you. And you can stay confessing, confessing, confessing all you want, but you're just spinning your wheels until you get in an attitude of praise the Lord for his goodness. Thank you, Lord, that when I called, you answered. Thank you, Lord, that you are working this whole thing for my good. Thank you, Lord, that you have turned this for my good. You have given me joy for morning. Thank you, Lord, that I'm strong in your presence. Thank you that you're here with me. Thank you that you're mighty to save and you have not lost sight of of your covenant in my life. When you begin to do it, oh, you have an atmosphere around you now. An atmosphere conducive to miracles. Just like outside it's raining because there's an atmosphere conducive to rain. Oh, yeah. An atmosphere of praise is conducive to miracle working power. It is conducive to healing power. It is conducive to provision power. Everything we need and believe for is in that atmosphere of praise. Because when his presence comes, that's his anointing coming. And that's what destroys the yoke and removes the burden. Praise creates an atmosphere. Look at Psalm 116.11. I don't know if I give you that one, Sarah. Psalm 116.11. I have done more the wrong thing because I am sweating, and I don't like to sweat, Brother John, just like your wife. I don't like sweating. It's very unpleasant. I'm not complaining. Thank you, Lord, that I'm healthy and I sweat. <laughs> I'm very healthy if that's what that is about. Oh, man, try Psalm 1611. Mm -hmm. That's it. You will show me the path of life. In your presence, there is fullness of joy. 
Praise creates an atmosphere. In your presence there is fullness of joy. What do we know about joy? What do we know about it? The joy of the Lord is our strength. Okay, run diagnostics. Am I Am I feeling strong in this area? No, not really. Okay, do I have any joy in this area? No, not really. Okay, have I been praising the Lord at all? No. Praise brings presence, brings joy, brings strength. This is the progression. When I praise the Lord, his presence comes. In his presence, there is fullness of joy. And where there is joy, there is strength. My spiritual strength, when I'm fighting a battle, when I am facing a situation, is going to depend on my praise level. It's going to depend on how much am I praising him. Because if I'm, not, if I'm only praising him on Sunday at church then I am very deficient in strength. I'm very deficient in joy because I'm not experiencing his presence like I'm supposed to. But when his presence comes, it infuses us with inner strength. It infuses us with joy. You can't feel sad in the presence of God. I'm taught, okay, I, I should read. You know what I mean. You can't feel hopeless if you're in an attitude of faith. You can't, um, this is so sad, this is so rough. Not when you're in an attitude of faith. No, I'm in a praise that's going to bring presence, that's going to bring joy, and that's going to result in my strength and my ability to last this, to outlast this storm, to outlast this contradiction. In God's presence is fullness of joy. Go to the next verse. One of these verses says, in his light... We see light. This is the other thing about praise. It readjusts our vision. It, it fixes our vision in his light. As I'm looking at him, as I've got my eyes off that stupid mountain, I'm not going to keep talking to it. If I just focus on it, then it's going to fill my consciousness, and I'm going to find myself talking about it and thinking about it all the time. No. I'm going to praise, and as I'm thinking about the Lord, as I'm meditating on him, as I'm worshiping him, I'm going to see the situation the right way. I'm going to see how great God is. I'm going to see how faithful he is. I'm going to see how he always keeps his promises, and that's going to illuminate the path forward for me. I'm not going to be confused. I'm not going to be wondering, well, what, what about all this stuff? No, in his light, in his presence, I see light. I see the way out, and praise is the way out. Praise is the road out. Always. Praise is the road out of exile. We're going to look at that in a minute. You show me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. Somewhere it says, in your light we see light. Look at this, Acts 16. So the atmosphere created by praise can, is meant to dominate us personally is meant to dominate our home, but then we can learn if we will stay in that atmosphere as we live our daily lives, out in public, doing our thing, doing our job, if we will stay there, then the atmosphere that we live in can begin to affect other people. Look at this. They, uh, Paul and Silas have just been beaten up. They brought them to the magistrates and said, These men, being Jews, exceedingly trouble our city, and they teach customs which are not lawful for us, being Romans, to receive or observe. Then the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates tore off their clothes and commanded them to be beaten with rods. And when they had laid many stripes on them, they threw them into prison, commanding the jailer to keep them securely. Having received such a charge, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. But, but, these two men who are physically hurting, can you imagine? We have a little symptom and we won't praise. We feel tired and we won't praise. No, they, they, they've just been beaten with rods, bloodied, aching. Who knows? 
maybe violently ill. They've been beaten so badly. And now they're in this stinking dungeon, fastened probably with sewage around them, all kinds of nastiness, not knowing what their future is. But at midnight, they know how to create an atmosphere to lift them out of that situation, out of the consciousness of their physical pain, out of, out of the fear of the future or what's going to happen, out of all the, what's going to happen to the church? Well, well, well how am I going to get out of this? How? No, no, they didn't even live there. They knew that if they praised, they would create a different atmosphere. So at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. I bet they didn't start at midnight. I don't know. It doesn't, the, the text doesn't tell us. I bet they had been at it as long as they were in there. I bet as soon as they got in there, it, what's left to do? I don't want to sit here and think about all this. I don't want to just sit here and, and think about and dwell on and stew on the symptoms in my body. I, I don't want to just think about the, the stink and stench around me or, or all the fear and torment in my mind. Here's, what, hi, here's how I'm going to escape this. I'm going to lift my voice to God. I'm going to escape this, this natural reality. I'm gonna, there's an escape hatch. I see it, and I'm coming up through that escape hatch, and I'm coming into a greater reality called the presence of God. And there's an atmosphere there that I need right down here. I don't want to live in this atmosphere. This is tormenting. This is terrible. But thank God I have a way out. I have a way out. You have a way out. I have a way out from anything I don't like in this life as it pertains to sickness or poverty, lack, depression, anything that's been passed down through our generations. We have a way out. Jesus has provided it. And when we believe and speak and then praise, we are lifted out of that mess we create an atmosphere but at midnight Paul and Silas were praying I bet they had been praying they were singing I bet they had been singing hymns to God and the prisoners were listening to them what the prisoners were listening to them and these prisoners are realizing uh the atmosphere in their cell is slightly different than the atmosphere in my cell. What they didn't know is the atmosphere in Paul and Silas's cell is about to overpower the atmosphere in the whole prison. Suddenly, there was a great earthquake. 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 So that the foundations of the prison were shaken and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's chains were loose. Go ahead, Sarah, to that one in Psalm. Look at this. This is not an isolated thing. Our praise, yes, we can learn to so live in an atmosphere of praise personally that it affects first us, then it affects our household, and then it affects us wherever we go. We're walking in this realm of God's presence, and we carry it with us where we go to where people, if they want, if they want, they can be encouraged when they come around us. If they want, they can receive good news. If they want to, they can benefit from the atmosphere that we live in. Trans no, let me see. Psalm 36, 1 through 3 in the Amplified. You probably couldn't read my writing. Transgression is to the wicked deep in his heart. They're not going to next verse. Uh, next verse. What in the world is up with me? Can I not read my own writing? 34, 1 through 3. I think it was 34 and I wrote down wrong. I'm glad Jason's not here to see this. Here we go. <laughs> I will bless the Lord at all times. I will. Everyone say, I will. It's an act of the will. I'm not waiting to bless the Lord at all times. I will wait for the Lord until he answers my prayers, and then I will bless him. That's not what this says. I will bless the Lord. I choose to bless him at all times, the good, the bad, especially the ugly. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. 
My life makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble and afflicted hear and be glad. What? The people who are continually purposing in their heart, I'm going to praise the Lord. I'm going to bless him. And I, I'm going to so train myself. To, when I have a moment, just thank you, Lord. Even if I'm at work, just thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. So what, what if someone hears me? Oh, they might hear hope. They might hear someone who's happy. They might hear somebody who's not complaining and feeling pitiful and sorry for them. Oh, thank the, well, Why are you thanking the Lord? Oh, glad you asked. Because I have a reason to. Because he's proven himself to be faithful. Let me, tell you what he, let me tell you what I just saw him do. Let me tell you what he did for me last year. Let me tell you what I saw him do in my friend's life. Let me tell you about his faithfulness. My life makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble and afflicted hear. Let them hear. Why? Because it has the power to make them glad. Next verse. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. It becomes an invitation for them. When I live in an atmosphere of praise and I carry that, I learn, I learn to train my mouth. I, when I have, I'm not going to just say something dumb or I'm not just going to stay silent. Lord, I'm doing dishes. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for providing. Thank you that we have food to eat. You may think it sounds dumb. Well, whatever. It's a habit that you're creating. It might feel unnatural at first. Persist in it. Anything that you do that is good feels weird at first. Eating healthy feels foreign at first. Exercising feels terrible at first. But if you keep at it, it becomes more natural and you see the benefits and effects of it. When we live in an attitude of praise and thanksgiving, we dispel self-pity. We dispel discouragement and despair. We have no fear in us because we're constantly praising the Lord. And it's keeping us strong. Then other people get to benefit from our atmosphere. It becomes an invitation to them. Oh, let me tell you what the Lord has done for me and he'll do the same for you. Praise creates an atmosphere. Yeah. And the atmosphere created by praise can dominate other atmospheres, just like it did in that prison cell, just like it did in, in Psalms here. Go ahead and look at Psalm 89. Praise brings presence. Presence brings joy. Joy brings strength. Strength to persevere. Strength to outlast the storm. Strength to laugh in the face of the enemy. Brings strength to believe until. It brings strength to even look foolishness. The Bible calls it the foolishness of faith. There are times you just look foolish standing in faith. That's how you know you are doing it right. Yeah. Happy are those, happy are those, what? Happy are those who hear the joyful call to worship, for they will walk in the light of your presence, Lord. What? It, the presence of the Lord is light. What does light do? It dispels darkness. So when you are praising, you need to be aware. Yeah, yes, your, your focus is 100% on the Lord. But when his presence comes, he is light and he's driving out of your life. Any bit of darkness or any effects of darkness, any effects of disease, any effects of weakness. As you praise and his presence is there, he doesn't come in segments. When you sense the presence of the Lord, you're sensing the healer. He's there with you. He didn't like drop off his healing anointing over here and he's coming to you as just comforter to be with you. No, when you sense the presence of the Lord, he is there and all of, all of who he is. He is there as healer. He is there as deliverer. He is there as comforter. He is there as the one who refreshes and strengthens you. He is there as your peace. He is there to repair and bend and mend a broken heart. Whatever you need, he is that in that moment. So when you're sensing his presence and you have a need in your body, you just need to be, wow, the healer is here. He's here to heal me. He didn't come to just say, I'm the healer, but you're not going to get it today. No, he's here to heal me. Just like the woman who heard and pressed, she didn't say, well, I don't know if he's in a healing mood today. I've heard that he's healed others, but I'm just going to touch him and maybe, maybe I'll just feel happy if I touch him. No. She knew that he's the healer. 
Happy are those who hear the joyful call to worship. They will walk in the light of your presence, Lord. They will rejoice all day long in your wonderful reputation. They will exult in your righteousness. This is talking about... Look, you are their glory, next one, I'm sorry, you are their glorious strength. It pleases you to make us strong. Do you see that? It's talking about the people who hear the call to worship, and then they enter in. They begin to rejoice. They begin to sing. They lift up their voice. They begin to move around. Thank you, Lord. I'm going to move my body. Why? Because if someone gave me a million dollars, I would move. If somebody walked up with a check for a million dollars, no strings attached, guess what you would do? Even the older ones, you would do something. Okay, yeah, yeah, all right. Maybe I can't jump or run, but I'm going to have some kind of movement in my body. Okay, then in the presence of the Lord, what if we did that? What if you did that at home? You're like, oh, I feel too weird. Okay, why don't you shut your door at the house and begin to thank the Lord? Thank you, Lord. I see this situation. You're so faithful. You've done it for me, Lord. You did it for our family. Look, I know you're turning this situation around. Sue, what if you did that? As you're thinking about Samuel, you just close the door for you. Hey, Lord, leave me alone in here for a little bit. And you just begin, thank you, Lord. I see that baby in the church being dedicated. Thank you, Lord. I see Hillary bringing that baby home. The first time I'm going to get to hold that baby at my house. Thank you, Lord. You just begin to thank him and praise him. You are their glorious strength. The people who praise have one who comes up beside them and becomes their glorious strength. Look, it pleases you to make us strong. When does he do that? As they worship him, as they praise. That's when strength comes. So if you're feeling weary in your faith, you're missing the praise. You're missing the praise. You're missing the praise. If you're feeling frustration, praise is the answer. It's the missing link. If you're feeling weird, I'm just weary and well doing. You're missing praise because people who praise are strong. People who praise are strong. They don't go back and forth. Praisers are always strong. Hallelujah. Now, th this is why it's good news because you can fix that today. If you're not that, it's easy to fix. You just start. Not overwhelming. You say, okay, tomorrow, my devotion time, I know what I'm going to do. I don't have to think about it now. I'm just going to start for the first 15 minutes. Why, why, why? Because we enter his presence with thanksgiving. We enter his courts with praise. There's a, a way in. There's a way into his presence. Proverbs 17, 22. If I was sweating before, I am perspiring now. I need some airflow on my neck. <sighs> Look at this. A joyful, cheerful heart. What? Well, I just don't feel. No, I, I will praise the Lord. And as I do praise the Lord, it's not a question. Look at this. You're initiating your own joy. Joy is not something God doles out. You get some, and you get some over here, and I made you special, so you get extra joy. You're going to be extra bubbly. No, that's not how that works. We have the level of joy that matches our level of praise. Our level of joy is an indication of our level of praise. So it is, it's something we initiate. I praise, God's presence comes, in his presence is joy, and I get strong. A joyful, cheerful heart brings healing to both body and soul. A joyful, cheerful heart brings healing. What? Does that mean as I'm praising the Lord, as I'm just worshiping him and, and smiling as I, as I think about how good he's been and how good he will be. What does that mean? That as I am joyful, right at that moment, healing is working in my body and my soul. This is what this says. Not while I'm worrying about how it's all going to happen. Not while I'm trying to calculate and figure out a path to victory. No, I have a path to victory already marked out for me. It's called praise and worship. It will get me to the desired end. 
A joyful, cheerful heart brings healing to body and soul. Okay. Amen, amen. I see the landing strip. Praise is an act of faith. Psalm 511. Is that what I gave you, Sarah? Just go with what I wrote. You know, I can't read my own handwriting, apparently. Let all those who take refuge and put their trust in you rejoice. Let them ever sing and shout for joy because you make a covering over them and defend them. Let those also who love your name be joyful and in you and be in high spirits. Everyone say high spirits. Just like when you're, when you, I don't know, what, what cranks your tractor, but when you're excited about something, that's how you ought to feel in the presence of the Lord. Let those who take refuge, put their trust in, let them rejoice. Let them ever sing and shout for joy because you are covering over them and defending them. Let those who know your name be joyful in you and be in high spirits, okay? Look at Luke 17. Praise is an act of faith. familiar passage about Jesus and ten lepers. Let's read this together. Then as he entered a certain village, there met him ten who were lepers who stood afar off. And they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. So when he saw them, he said to them, Go show yourselves to the priests. And so it was that as they went, they were cleansed. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, returned, and with a loud voice, not with a meditative, thank you, Lord, with a loud voice glorified God and fell down on his face at his feet, giving him thanks. And he was a Samaritan. What? He wasn't even part of the covenant. He didn't even have a right to healing. He was a Samaritan. But he responded appropriately to what Jesus had done for him. So Jesus an answered and said, Were there not ten cleansed, but where are the nine? Were there not any found who returned to give glory to God except this foreigner? And he said to him, Arise your way. Your faith has made you Whole. That word well is whole. Your faith has made you whole. Your faith. Your faith. Your faith. What did he do different? The, the rest of them, they came to Jesus. He cleansed them. He stopped the process of leprosy. He healed them. But whatever they, part they were missing, whatever had been already eaten off of leprosy was not restored. The disease was stopped, but that if they lost their, their digits, they still don't have them. If they lost an arm, they still don't have it. They lost their toes or part of their foot, they still don't have them. This guy returns with a loud voice, lifted up, glorifying God, begins to worship, and Jesus calls that worship faith. Your faith has made you well. He's worshiping, and Jesus says, your faith has made you whole. Not well, whole. This guy not only has leprosy stopped in his body, but body parts that would have been missing got put back. Oh my. Do we have a precedence for that in the Bible? Yes, we do. That, that worship and praise can put things back that have been missing, can put things back in place that have been stolen. Praise and worship is faith. This Jesus says, when this, this guy comes back, begins to fall down and with a loud voice glorify God, Jesus says, hey, that's faith, and your faith just got you wholeness. The other nine, I don't know where they are. They're, they're missing their chance. They could have had wholeness too. All they did, they obeyed the command of faith. Yeah, but they didn't go the next step and praise. But this guy says, hey, I'm going back to thank the Lord. I'm going to go give him honor and glory. And this guy ends up with wholeness. This guy ends up with everything that had been eaten off of him, put back on him. And Jesus called his worship faith. Yes, 
Worship and praise is an act of faith. It keeps you in faith. It keeps you strong in faith, no matter how long it takes. Look at, go ahead and go to um, 2 Chronicles 20. We'll end with this. There's two or three Psalms where it says this. The Lord is my strength and my song and has become my salvation. Strength, song, salvation. Notice that the song precedes salvation. He's saying, the Lord is my strength. I see who you are. You're my source. You're the strength of my life. I praise you. I sing a song to you because of who you are. I sing, and the one that I sing to saves me. He becomes my salvation. Look at this. Now all Judah, I read this other night. I know we read this one a lot, but this is a specific word to our church. This is why we come back to this often. Because God gave this word to Jason that this was a way that we're going to leverage the enemy. Now all Judah with their little ones, their wives, and their children stood before the Lord. They're in dire straits. Then the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jehaziel, son of Zechariah, the son of Beniah, the son of Jeel, the son of Mataniah, a Levite of the sons of Asaph, in the midst of the assembly. And he said, listen, all you of Judah and you inhabitants of Jerusalem, and you, King Jehoshaphat, thus says the Lord to you, do not be afraid nor dismayed because of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours but God's. Tomorrow go down against them. They will surely come up by the ascent of Ziz, and you will find them at the end of the brook before the wilderness of Jeruel. You will not need to fight in this battle, but position yourselves, position yourselves, stand still, position yourselves, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord who is with you, O Judah and Jerusalem. Do not fear or be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them, for the Lord is with you. Look at this. They hear the word. Faith comes, and how, what is the evidence? What is the expression that faith has come? And Jehoshaphat bowed his head with his face to the ground. And all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem bowed before the Lord, worshiping the Lord. Then the Levites of the children of the Kohathites and the children of the Korites stood up to praise the Lord, the God of Israel, with their voices loud and high. What is the evidence that they have received this word? They begin to praise the Lord. They don't go into question mode. Uh, okay, prophet, I have a question for you. Uh, 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 we need some details. No, their immediate response to a word Again, they are, in fa they are facing an innumerable host of armies that have, that have allied together against them. They are vastly outnumbered. And not only that, they're behind because this army is already marching toward them. So they don't have time to do a lot of preparation. So it looks really bad for them. But they hear a word from the Lord, and they respond in praise and thanksgiving to the Lord. So they rose early in the morning and went out to the wilderness of Tekoa. As they went out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, Judah, and you inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord of your God, and you shall be established. Believe as prophets, and you shall prosper. And when he had consulted with the people, he appointed those who should sing to the Lord. I said the other night, the Lord didn't even give them an instruction to do this. This is an act of faith. But I'm, just when I read that, position yourselves, I'm like, there, 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 something in him must have known. The Spirit of God speaking to him said, here's the position that you're going to take. Praise and worship. It's the high ground. It's the advantage ground. If you take this position of praise and worship and keep your eyes on me, this is how you position yourself to win the victory. You don't start down here. No, you come up to a high place and worship and praise. You position yourself. And what do you consult? 
alone with the people. He appointed those who should sing to the Lord and who should praise the beauty of holiness. And as they went out before the army, they were saying, Praise the Lord, for his mercy endures forever. Look, now when they began to sing and praise, the NLT says, at the very moment they began to sing and praise, even though they're not before the army, the army is maybe miles ahead of them, but they're going out to face them and they take their position of praise and worship. They're creating an atmosphere that's going to drive the fear out. You understand? They're sitting, their whole lives, their lineage, everything is at stake. So what do they do? They create an atmosphere. No, I can't, we can't afford fear right now. We can't afford to start trembling. We can't afford to think of a bad outcome. How are we going to occupy our minds for these several miles that we're going to march with the, our artillery, whatever we have? How are we going to keep our minds focused on, oh, oh, we're going to praise. We're going to put something in our mouth. Whoever gets your mouth gets to move in your life. Whoever gets your mouth gets the right to move in your life. And they said, we're not giving place to the spirit of fear. We're not going to be dismayed because the prophet said, don't fear. Don't be discouraged. Don't do this. Well, how, how do we not? How do we not? When we're faced against this, we put something else in our mouth. We lift our eyes to a different sight and we begin to praise the Lord. And at the very moment they begin to praise. The Lord sends ambushments against the people of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir who had come against Judah, and they were defeated. I'm talking about at the very moment, it says. They don't know that. They're just standing and and doing their best to take a position to create an atmosphere to keep fear at bay, to keep darkness out, to keep their hearts set on the Lord. And as they're doing that, the Lord says, hey, I've got this covered before you even see it. You're way over here. But if you'll praise your way all the way here, you're going to find a defeated army in front of you when you arrive. This is the path to victory. It's praise. Praise is the highway. Praise is the breakthrough. Look at this. God is not moved by our emotions, okay? He's not moved by by us crying and, and feeling sad. That doesn't move him. He is compassionate, but he's given us everything we need. He's done everything in his power to provide us victory. So when we choose weeping and moaning and groaning, he's not attracted to that. That won't move him at all. Because there are laws that govern faith. No, he is only moved, only, only moved by faith. And praise and worship is an act of faith. Look at, last few verses here. Isaiah 52. Listen to what Smith Wigglesworth said. Real faith has perfect peace and joy and a shout at any time. At any time. Oh, it doesn't look good. Well, I'm not looking at what it is. It always sees the victory, he said. Always. Praise is the breakthrough. When I praise, I break through. When we talk about breakthrough, I don't want us to get a wrong thing in, my, in, in mind. God has already broken through to humanity. He's done that. So as far as he is concerned, his equation of the breakthrough has happened. He done broke through. So when we talk about breakthrough, what are we talking about? We're talking about us breaking through. We're talking about there are things around us. There are atmospheres around us. There are, there are fears around us. There are maybe doubts or, or worries or anxieties or, or bad situations around us. What does praise do? It breaks us out of what is limiting us. It breaks us out of those feelings. It breaks us out of those, those emotions. Listen, how beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who proclaims peace and brings tiding of good things, who proclaims salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. Your watchmen. What? Watchmen. Oh, that's, that's, that's who we are as a church. Your watchmen shall lift up their voices. Oh, with their voices they shall sing together. 
Watchmen are only to warn and, and to rebuke. They're not only to say, turn around, repent. They're not only to lift their voice to the Lord in intercession. Watchmen are also supposed to sing together, for they shall see eye to eye when the Lord brings back Zion. Break forth into joy. What? Isn't joy supposed to break into me? Isn't joy just supposed to come to me? No. Joy's right here, and I'm here in my feelings, and I'm here looking at the natural, and I can choose to let that dominate me and me be grumpy and frustrated. And t- I should have worked by now. Maybe I don't have enough. I can choose to live there, or I can say, I choose to break out of this and thank the Lord I choose to break forth into joy I'm going to break into joy how am I gonna, I'm going to put praise in my mouth because when I do his presence is going to come and I'm going to be in an atmosphere of joy I'm breaking into it I'm not waiting for it to break into me I'm breaking into joy sing together you waste places of Jerusalem for the Lord has comforted his people he has redeemed Jerusalem next one Isaiah 54 1 Sing, O barren, you who have not born. No, don't sing later after you've had children. Sing right now. While you're waiting for the miracle, while you're waiting for the word to be filled, hey, sing, O barren, break forth into singing. Push yourself out of the flesh. Push yourself out of the feelings. Push yourself out of the mental realm because there you'll be defeated every time. No, what you have to do is just break forth into it. Just break out into it. Do whatever you have to do. Break out into it. Next verse, Isaiah 55. For as the rain comes down and all the snow from heaven, and do not return there, but water the earth, and make it bring forth in bud, that it may bring seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. For you shall go out. He's talking about about a people who are in exile at the moment. But he's telling them, you've been kept out of your promised land. You've been exiled. You've been kept out. You've been removed from the promise. But I have sent you a word. And the word that I've sent you is enough. It's watering. And just like I've given a word that prospers the, the plants and foliage, the word I've sent you is going gonna, is gonna to accomplish the thing that I've sent it to do. So you shall go out with joy. Out of what? Out of this captivity. Out of this bondage. How are you going to go out? With joy. How am I going to get out of this place? I feel so constricted. I'm bound. I feel bound by weakness or by sickness or, or by pain or by whatever. How are you going to get out? With joy. How do I get from here to there? With joy. He is instructing them, you're in exile now, but if you choose praise, if you choose thanksgiving, if you choose joy, it's going to take you from there to here. You'll be let out with peace. The mountains and hills shall break forth the singing before you, and all the fields shall clap their hands. All the trees of the field will clap their hands together. Praise is a breakthrough in and of itself. It's a lifestyle celebration. First Thessalonians, you don't have to go there, I'll just say it's, it's like easy. Oh, there it is. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, in everything. Diary missed that one. Give thanks, for this is the will of God. This, is the, this simplifies the will of God in one little bitty verse. In everything, give thanks. This is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Hebrews, last one, Hebrews. Therefore, by him let us continually offer the sacrifices of praise to God. Continually. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. Wonder why the Bible, the Psalms, all throughout the Psalms, and in the New Testament echoes this need for us to continually praise, continually worship. Why in heaven are they continually praising and continually worship? Because it creates an atmosphere. 
It creates an atmosphere where anything is possible. It creates an atmosphere where darkness can't stand. It draws his anointing. And where his, there, his anointing is, there is no yoke. There is no bondage. There's no burden that can stand under the anointing. So I'm telling you, time to diagnose the problem. And this is the breakthrough for us, I believe. It's time to praise. Amp it up. Personally, first. Corporately, yes. But if, if you're not doing it in your personal life, then when you come here, you don't have as much to add. So get, I'm just saying, get used. To, if you've been spinning your wheels, if you're feeling frustrated, if you're feeling what, 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 this is your answer today. The Holy Ghost is giving you an answer. It's praise. It's just praise. It's not, you're not doing everything wrong. You're just missing out one thing that is actually very enjoyable to do. You don't have to go, you don't even have, this even, you don't even have to fast over it. <laughs> well, yeah, yay. Praise is like the most enjoyable thing. And God is saying, here's your answer. Here's your sign. It's just praise. It's just to exalt. It's just to get your mind off of the why not, what's taking so long. I done talk to the mountain. Don't talk to it anymore. Stop talking to it and start praising him. That's the breakthrough. Break forth into joy. See it done. And from that place of seeing it done, not, we're not looking at anything out here to change. We're not even looking for that. That's, that's done. It's, it's changing. So I'm looking in here with eyes of faith. I'm seeing it done. I'm seeing what it looks like. I'm imagining Samuel here being dedicated. I'm imagining Hillary carrying him around and him, you know, crying with a loud voice. Strong lungs. And from that place... Thank you, Lord. Doesn't matter. Does not matter what report. If he has a day here or there, that doesn't even that doesn't change anything. When you're believing for for some, you you do not consider. Abraham didn't consider anything. He didn't. Well, time to reason. Time time to figure this out. No, he stayed strong as he gave thanks and praise to God. That's our answer. Come on, let's stand up.